Hello, and thank you for joining us for a very important conversation. So we will be talking to you today about suicide prevention and what we do in Round Rock ISD to help support our students and our families across the district. My name is Dr. LaShonda Lewis, and I am the Director of Counseling Services. Within my department, I also have Carrie Hunt, who is our Counseling Services Coordinator. And then we also have our Social Emotional Learning Coordinator, um, Gina Norton, to join us today. Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Amy Grosso. I'm the Director of Behavioral Health Services here in the district. And also part of my department is Bree Borksat, who is the Coordinator of Social Work Services. And so we're so glad you're tuning in for this important discussion. As we approach a subject such as suicide and mental health, it's really important that we talk about what kind of space we're setting up for this discussion. And even virtually, I think it's important for us to think about how we're talking about these things and the ideas and the mindset we come to this. And I like to use this graphic when we talk about um, especially suicide and that we need to come to this discussion from a place of empath empathy and not judgment. Um, suicide and suicide awareness. And oftentimes there's a lot of judgment that comes with it. And already the topic of suicide surrounding it is a lot of shame, guilt that happens for people. And so it's critical that when we come to this discussion, either with our own experience or maybe not, and we're just here to learn, that we come to it from a place of empathy, of really trying to understand where people are coming from and what is happening for people. And instead of jumping into that place of judgment, which really stops the conversation. So like Dr. Grosso was saying, how we talk about suicide really does matter. Um, we've heard a lot from, from parents and um, sometimes even from our students that um, having a conversation about suicide may make someone want to do it. Having the conversation about suicide and asking people how they're doing, where they are with their mental well-being is really important and actually helps to prevent suicide. Opening up those doors to conversations can be really beneficial to a person that is in a place where they may not be feeling so well. But the words that we use around suicide are really important as well. We don't wanna use phrases like commit suicide or su successful attempt. These phrases really perpetuate the stigma around suicide. And so when we talk about um, someone dying by suicide, we want to say that that person died by suicide, not they committed suicide or an attempt was successful. Um, someone's life um, no longer being in existence is not something that we want to, to celebrate and we don't want to use language around that. We also wanna avoid details about suicide methods. Um, don't refer to lethal means unless your story would be incomplete to the listener without it. Um, we know that there is a contagion effect and we don't want to perpetuate um, dying by suicide as a way to resolve any issues that may be going on in a person's life. Um, in regards to how people die by suicide, and we're gonna to get to this a little bit later on, but it's also important that all the people around an individual who may have thoughts of suicide, who may have mentioned um, wanting to take their life in the past, that they understand the roles that they play in that person's life and making sure that there are items, um, let's say, weapons, um, guns, or knives, or anything like that, that that is not easily accessible by, um, to someone who is struggling with their mental well-being. We also don't want to simplify suicide. Dr. Gross always tells this story about, um, you know, if someone is struggling with their diabetes or, or, or physical health, and they happen to eat a really greasy burger, and they um, were to pass away after consuming that burger. We don't say that that burger is what caused someone to die by, um, we don't, they didn't die because of that one burger. There was a multitude of factors that played into um, this person's um, loss of life. And suicide is really the same way. Um, a lot of times people will think that when a person dies by suicide, that it was whatever that last event was that happened in that individual's life. But usually there is a lot more that takes place and a lot of other events and a lot of other struggles that this person may be going through that um, we may not be privileged to and we may not be able to see that um, led up to this event. We also don't want to glorify suicide. A few years ago, 
there was a um, a series that was out called 13 Reasons Why. And this was really controversial because many people saw this as a way th um, that people were glorifying suicide, especially in our youth. And so we don't want to romanticize this, this event. People that are struggling with their mental well-beings, people that are struggling with thoughts of suicide, um, we want to be able to connect them to supports so that um, they can build on the skills that they need to overcome some of the difficulties that they may be um, dealing with. And we also want to make sure that we're not portraying suicide as an option. It's not a rational um, backup or coping behavior. We want to make sure that we're connecting individuals of all ages, where we're talking about students or where we're talking about adults, if they're struggling with thoughts of suicide, we want to connect them as quickly as possible to professionals, whether that is a school counselor, um, we have social workers within our district, um, helping them build those SEL skills or connecting them to therapists outside of the school setting. We want to connect them to resources as quickly as possible to help them find positive coping mechanisms for whatever is going on in their life at this time. So as we talk about and, and really refine our language around suicide, it's also extremely important that we understand what suicide is. Yeah, and I think, you know, Dr. Lewis talking about we have this baseline of how we approach it and how we talk about, but but really understanding what it is. And I always tell parents um, a lot of times when presenting to them and even staff, you know, if you think about it, I know when I was growing up, these are not topics we openly discussed. It's not something it was very taboo. And, you know, a lot of times it still is. Um, or there's such a shame and stigma. And so we just took the silent approach. And so many of us are coming to this and saying, we as adults need to understand more if we're going to help our students. So I don't want anybody to feel bad that they don't already know these things. That's why you're watching this. That's this is why we're here. And that's why education is such a critical aspect. I also want to let you know that everything we're presenting that's regarding suicide and mental health in general is really based on best practice and research. Research around suicide really has only been happening the last two decades. And so we're learning new things all the time and throughout our departments in the district that deal in this aspect of mental health and suicide, we're always refining how we, um, what we're doing, how we're responding based on what latest research tells us. But before we can even start talking about suicide, it's really important for us to understand mental health. And we'll get to the, why that's an important aspect for us to understand. But mental health, and a lot of times when we talk about suicide, we only think about the crisis situations, right? We either think everything's great or it's an ultimate crisis. And realizing we have to get away from that thinking. Um, you know, like Dr. Lewis was saying, the example of your physical health and the cheeseburger, like there's a lot that goes in between the first diagnosis and everything that happens. And the same is with mental health, that we go, we can be very healthy with our mental health and then we can go where we're struggling, but we're still coping to maybe we're just completely struggling and then to a point of unwell and crisis. And all of us as a, employees of the district, students, family members, community members, we really have to start realizing that it's a continuum and how can we start identifying early on before it's a crisis situation. Um, and some of us, honestly, with our mental health, we're always going to be at least in a coping phase. I always use myself as an example. I have struggled with anxiety my whole life. Um, it's managed really well now through uh, getting assistance. Um, and so I'm in that coping phase, right? My anxiety is not going to ever go away. It's part of who I am. Just in the same way, if I was a diabetic, that diabetes it doesn't just magically go away, but I learned how to cope with that. And I think that's the normalizing of mental health and how it can be part of our lives, but we can really learn to live with it. It's also and important for, oh, go ahead. <laughs> I, was, I was just gonna add, and I think, you know, that kind of goes to what we were, what I was saying earlier about having those conversations around mental health and mental well-being. And for someone to hear that this may be something that they're living with for, for a long time may be hard to accept, but helping them understand that there's resources out there, there's coping skills, that there are strategies that they can use can help them to think about that a little more, um, to better accept that um, and to equate it to your physical health and how, you know, if you have diabetes or you have high blood pressure or something like that, it's not going to go away overnight, but you learn how to manage it and you have a support team around you. 
Yeah, and I love it. And I think the more we talk about it, for forever, people who struggled with mental health, they wouldn't openly say, hi, I struggle with depression or anxiety. And so then I think when people suffered with something like that, they they didn't see anybody managing it and still living life. And I think the more, especially as adults, those of us who have that story can tell it and say, you can find a ways of coping and still living the life that you want. I think the more that that gives hope um, to our students and to other adults that might struggle. And I think this is where it comes in that, you know, many different things impact our mental health. It's not just one thing. And, you know, as you can see that there's a continuum of like, the individual yourself and how you're made up, um, the family situation and family genetics to community environment and society and all these things um, impact our mental health. And I wanna be really specific to say too, this isn't just in a negative way, it's in a positive way too, of how these all different things that we get to really define as a community as we're coming in this presentation and talking about that the community can have just as much a positive impact on students' mental health as it can a negative. And so those are the little things we can think about every day of how are we impacting the mental health of ourselves, but all of those around us too. There has been so much talk since COVID happened. I know you probably were hoping we wouldn't say that word here, but <laughs> there's a lot of talk about the mental health, especially of our students and our teens because of COVID. And I do think it is a good thing that's come out out of a COVID is that we're paying more attention to the mental health of students. But I want us all to realize that mental health didn't mental health struggles for students didn't just start because of COVID. And so these are some important information and statistics that pre pandemic one in five children ages three to 17 um, reported some kind of, you know, emotional, mental, developmental or behavioral disorder. So this is not anything new that's happened. Um, and it's also important to realize that even though we knew students were struggling with mental health disorders, more than half didn't get adequate treatment. So I just want you to sit with that. More than half didn't get treatment. And I think, you know, for those of us who've worked in this field for a long time, we've we've known this. And I do think it's it, it's a positive that more in society and in the community are realizing the mental health struggles that our students are dealing with. Also from 2000 to 2000, 2009 to 19, the percentage of high school students that they self-reported this feeling of sad and hopelessness increased by 40%. And then to go along with that from 2007 to 2018, suicide rates um, from 10 to 24 year, year olds in the United States increased by 57%. So once again, I want you to just sort of put this in perspective of everything we're hearing about mental health of students since the pandemic um, has to be taken into context with what was happening pre-pandemic. And so it is not a new thing that students were struggling. You know, we talked of even pre-COVID of the mental health crisis of students. And so I think it's just really shown a light on it. And you might say, okay, these are statistics for the United States, what's really happening in our own area. And so I like to um, give a perspective, and this is the number of suicides for students in Texas, and that's ages 10 to 19. And this graph starts from 2019 and goes to 2009 and goes to 2019. And as you can see, rates have steadily increased. That top line is overall the orange line is males and the gray line is females. If you will also notice, there's a big difference between males and females. Um, it was a few years ago, I noticed that it was at 17 and 18, I got really excited to see the, the number of suicides for students had gone down. And I got excited until I realized it went down for females, but it didn't go down for males, it continued to increase. And so these are the things we continue to think about and talk about uh, the differences in these and what does that mean and how do we make sure we're reaching um, our boys just as much as our girls. For me, it's how do we talk about mental health and you know, there's always been a stigma about mental health. I think it's going down for a lot of teens, but what messages do we give our boys? Uh, you know, even thinking like, do we tell little boys like you can't cry like in those type of things, which then get internalized. So maybe they don't feel like they can speak up about their mental health. And these are long term and discussions we have um, as our departments together all the time of how do we make sure all students um, get the support they need for mental health. So what's happened since COVID and, you know, um, 
I love data a lot. You know, reports we have and stuff, data really does lag up behind um, from time to time. But things that we know, the U.S. Surgeon General Advisory put out a, a whole report um, this last December about the mental health crisis facing students. And they talked about what are risk factors because of COVID that have impacted students' mental health? Because um, not all students have been increased mental health struggles because of COVID. So what are those? What things have really happened? And as you can see, there's a different areas. Like if you have family members who are frontline workers, that's going to impact. Or if your parents are more likely to be in careers that were at such a high level that they became burned out, um, just worried about COVID. Um, Bree, who's part of my department, she always talks about with this idea about worrying about COVID. There's a term called emotional contagion that is this idea that we pick up on the emotions of others around us and it's sort of contagious. And so we as the adults, if we're always saying one extreme or the other, guess what our students are doing? Um, I always use this example too, that I'm naturally a worrier, but like trying to have a discussion with my dad about that and like how I went to therapy for it. And he's so supportive, but he was just like, we're a family of warriors, right? So a lot of how we present ourselves, our, um, our kids pick up on that. A few other things that I wanna point out, ACEs is the adverse childhood um, experiences that we, there's a ton of research that's been happening for a while about what are these traumatic experiences that happen to children and how that has a lasting impact. And so those continue um, to happen within the pandemic. Um, one, it talks about discrimination. So how that impacts students, you know, um, there was a report recently that the rates of suicide did go down in 2020, but it didn't for all all groups. And for example, um, young black males, it has increased um, in that age group. And so realizing what different factors, I always point out too, um, our LGBTQ students are six times more likely to attempt suicide than, than other students. And that's things we really have to look at. Also want to point out, it said um, experiencing trauma from losing a family member or caregiver to COVID. Um, over 140,000 um, kids have lost their primary or secondary caregiver to COVID in realizing that that um, impacts them. It's also more disproportionately to families who are already living in poverty. And so realizing that that impacts a lot of different things we see on this list. Um, but what we do know is that majority of people who die by suicide, they had a mental health condition at the time of death. Um, now, it doesn't mean that it was being treated or even diagnosed. But we also know that most people with mental health conditions do not die by suicide. So whenever we talk about suicide prevention, mental health is one of the biggest things, and it's why we started with that. Now, it doesn't mean if you struggle with mental health, you're even going to be suicidal. It just means it's one of those things we need to look out for. And that's where we, it comes in for us to talk about risk factors. Um, just like there's risk factors for heart disease, um, diabetes, different kinds of physical health conditions, there are risk factors for suicide. And they come in three different areas, health, historical, and environmental. Um, those are pretty much the same for different physical health conditions. In all honesty, I can't wait for the day that we just call it all health and it, it incorporates the physical health and the mental health because they do impact each other. Um, the health aspect is um, do you have a mental health condition? Those we, as we've talked about a lot, also someone with chronic pain or serious head injury, head injuries. If you follow the NFL a lot, um, there's so much studies being done about um, concussions and traumatic brain injuries, which happens with our veterans a lot and its impact on suicide. Now, it doesn't mean if this has happened to you, you're even going to be suicidal. It just means we need to, it's a risk factor. So we look more out for it. Also historical is there a history of trauma, abuse? Is there a family history of suicide or mental health conditions? And once again, we know that, that those are risk factors. Also, a previous suicide attempts are considered a risk factor. Um, it's important to know that most people who do have a suicide attempt go on to live very productive and meaningful lives. But we have to look at those risk factors. And the last is environmental. Um, environmental are the things we see like prolonged stress, um, life events, access to lethal means, um, 
contagion, as Dr. Lewis mentioned earlier, of how we talk about it, and that's why it's so important, is that there, especially in young adults, this contagion factor, if I'm exposed to very suicides or very graphic depictions of suicide, I can be at higher risk, especially if I have these other risk factors. And as she mentioned with the example of the cheeseburger, what often happens in society, we see the environmental factor, which is really the tip of the iceberg. And we don't see everything else that was underwater. And honestly, it's not necessarily ours to understand at all, right? But this is where a lot of times judgment comes in. And we're very judgmental of people who die by suicide. And going along with how we talk about suicide matters, that judgment, if we're portraying it, even when it's, say, a famous person who's died by suicide, and we say certain phrases, it's very judgment and condemning that impacts those around us that might be struggling themselves, or it impacts those who've already lost someone to suicide. It's so one of the risk factors is a family history of suicide. And so if they don't feel safe in talking about that or receiving the support, then we know that's a risk factor. And that's why it's really important to come to this from a place of empathy and understanding instead of judgment. So those are risk factors, right? Like the things way ahead that we need to look out for and things we can do um, to sort of say, okay, I might be at higher risk. I need to be aware of this. But what are warning signs? And warning signs are those things really that happen in a moment that let us know, oh, something might happen sooner than later. And I need to really pay attention to that. And they come in three areas, talk, behavior, and mood. Talk would be how are they talking about, um, are they talking about being hopeless, that life's not worth living? Um, I often, you know, a lot of times we get told, get asked in our jobs, like, don't people just say that for attention? And I'm always really careful to say, A, I'm not going to make that judgment of if it's for attention or not. I need to approach it with empathy. And second, even if it is for attention, that's not a healthy coping strategy. So that person needs help anyway. So it's not something to be ignored. Um, even if somebody jokes about suicide, I always check in like we don't, A, because then maybe they're joking because they don't know how else to say it, but B, it's not a topic to be joked about. And so that's a teachable moment. Uh, so that talk is really important. Behavior too, a lot of times I think when we think about suicide or depression, we think of somebody just crying a lot and really sad. But do we know that maybe for some boys or even girls that I just get really anger, angry and irritable and that that could be a warning sign? The big thing, especially as families who are watching this and community members, have you noticed a change in behavior? And it doesn't mean that automatically means the person's suicidal. It just means you need to check in and have a discussion and say, hey, what's going on? And the last one's mood. Has that mood of the student changed? And this even goes with behavior. Some always say, you know, it's normal for a teenager not to want to hang out with their parents anymore, right? Too cool. Like, I want to be with my friends. Like, that's a normal part of adolescent development. What's not normal is a student who has been highly social and involved with friends to withdraw from everything. That is a warning sign for us. And so those are the things we look out for. I always say, trust your gut especially if you're the parents, you know your kid, um, it never hurts to ask. I often always say too, if you've never brought up a mental health talk or suicide to your kid, how hard is it for them to tell you if they're struggling? If it's hard for you to say the word suicide, but then your kid's struggling with those thoughts, how hard is it for them to tell you? Um, it's a myth that if you bring it up, it plants the seed. Actually, research tells us if you bring it up and you ask the question, are you thinking of killing yourself? Are you having suicidal thoughts? We know that that actually decreases the rates of suicide because then you can have an open discussion for someone to get help. And then with that, you know, that's all what's happened. But we also know there's also a lot of protective factors, like these proactive things we can do um, as individuals and as a community um, to help all of us with mental health and suicide, um, access to mental health. And we'll talk about this in a little bit about even the supports we have here in the district that are important. Um, feeling connected to community and family. A lot of people don't realize that, you know, when our teachers build really meaningful relationships with students and that that's a safe place, that's a protective factor for suicide. 
that's suicide prevention work at the very basic, important level. Pro problem solving skills and coping skills that I know Gina will talk some about with an SEL, that's important too. And then cultural and religious beliefs, if they are about help seeking and feeling connected, those are protective factors. And the last one is limiting access to means. Um, when kids are really little, we talk about like locking up medication and locking up firearms and those type of things. But if somebody's struggling with their mental health, those are actually very, um, they seem simple things, but they are life-saving me measures and very protective factors that can happen. I'm now going to pass it to Gina to talk some about, to start us on the discussion of what we do here in Round Rock ISD for, in regards to suicide prevention. All right. So as we start this, we're going to have a little visual and we're going to take a little break and listen to a story. So I want to walk you through this story, this parable. And if you want to close your eyes or just take some deep breaths with it, it would be great. And just kind of build the image of the stream that we have on the screen and kind of focus in on that as you listen to the story. All right. So you're walking along a river one day and you hear a plea from help from someone drowning. You're startled, but energized as you dive into the water and you save him. Using all your strength, you pull him to the shore and start administering CPR. Your adrenaline, your adrenaline is racing as he starts to regain consciousness. And just as you get back to your feet, another frantic call comes from the river. You can't believe it. You you dive back in to that river and you pull out a woman who also needs life-saving care. Now a bit frazzled, but you're still thrilled because you've saved two lives in one day. You mop the sweat off your brow. And when you turn around, however, you see more drowning people coming down the river one after another. You shout out to all the other people around you. We need some help. Come help. Now there are several people in the river with you. They're pulling drowning people out left and right. One of the rescuers swims out to the drowning group and tries to start teaching them how to tread water. This strategy is helpful to some of the people, but not all, because it turns out it's really hard to learn how to tread water when you're drowning. Everyone looks at each other completely overwhelmed, wondering when this will stop. Finally, you stand up and you start running upstream. Another rescuer glares at you and shouts, where are you going? We need help. To which you reply, I'm going upstream to find out who's pushing all of these people into the river. So just take a couple of deep breaths and process that. So that's managing a crisis. We're managing as this is occurring. But at some point, we have to take that step back and figure out what's going on. What can we do to prevent this from happening? And so as you look at the graphic up there, we're promoting resilience with every student. We're trying to inoculate those students who are at risk or may have some of those ACEs built up in their past. And we want to normalize that it's okay to help each other out, to build that strong connection with others. When you're overwhelmed, when you're upset, that there's someone you can go to for that assistance. And as we've already talked about, reducing access to those lethal means and connecting each other to the help that they need to move forward and to move through the crisis. So we're going to talk about what we do for all students here in Round Rock ISD. And we do that through social and emotional learning. And the goal of SEL is to help students acquire and apply knowledge, skills, and attitudes that help them develop their identity in a healthy way, to manage their emotional response, and to achieve their personal goals that are out there. And we do that through creating connections with the adults in their lives. So their teachers, their counselors, their principals, their any staff that are on campus, the lunch lady, the bus driver, our educational assistants that are so valuable in helping our students stay grounded and 
connected to their community. Um, we make sure or we try to make sure all our spaces are safe and respectful that everyone is a valuable member of those spaces. We also provide curriculum that supports their social emotional growth. And we'll talk a little bit more about specific programs that are available to students. And we're working to implement a multi-tiered model of intervention for students that are based specifically on their social emotional needs and their behavioral factors as well. And we bring all those in to support each student where they are in a holistic way. All right, we can move on to what we specifically use here in Round Rock. Um, all campuses K-8 have access to second step curriculum. That is a research-based curriculum that provides connection to the CASEL competencies. And that's what we use to address SEL in our district and it's used across the country. Um, campus administrators do have the autonomy to develop their own SEL program and they build that into their day according to the campus needs. Each campus also has a designated SEL campus coordinator that communicates with me and their school community to make sure we're addressing the needs that they have in their particular school. High school campuses focus on building community through restorative practices. That is another research-based program that focuses on that relationship building piece and restoring um, relationships if they're strained or broken within the school community. At middle school and elementary, there are a variety of programs out there in addition to second step. We'll move on to the next slide that shows you a little bit about those. Um, second step and restorative are the most used programs in our district, but we also have a high incidence or usage of capturing kids' hearts. PBIS, which is Positive Behavior Interventions and Supports. Emergent Tree, Mindful Classroom, and Leader and Me are also widely used programs within the district as well. All of these are research-based and have um, a lot of good practices that we build together to make sure that we're supporting our students. Um, there's also a variety of other programs used, and we just make sure that we're really tailoring those to the needs on, on a particular campus. But you can reach out to your campus administrators to learn more about what they use specifically, and also your teaching staff that um, for your students. And I will pass it back over to talk about counseling services, which is another important component to our entire system here in Round Rock. Thank you, Gina. Well, before I talk about what we do specifically in counseling services, I, I just wanna point out that um, SEL, Counseling Service Behavioral Health, we're part of what we call a, lar a larger group of what we call the care team in our district. And our care team is made up of not only our groups, but other departments such as special ed, um, our behavioral um, department, um, our families in transition, our homeless um, population, um, and a few other departments. We have a district-wide care team and our focus is really looking at how we can be preventative in nature for our students so that we're putting stuff in place so that um, we don't get to a place where we have students who um, are in high need of um, mental health support or behavioral support, because we know all of that impacts everything that happens with our students. So the work that we do across our district and our campuses, um, our desire is that each one of our campuses has a care team as well. And so we're starting to pilot those um, this school year. But the work that we want to do is, is more preventive in nature. We want to provide our students with the skills they need to be successful um, individuals, successful young people, but also successful adults. And we want to do that so that they have success not only in their academic life, but also in their social, their emotional, their um, and their, their physical life and their personal lives. Because we know if we can help them develop those skills now as um, K-12 students, that they're gonna take those skills and transition that into what they do later on in their life. So specifically what 
how counseling services plays um, into the preventative nature of the work that we do with our students is every single one of our campuses across our school district has um, counselors on their campus. And our, our counselors are all master's level professionals. They hold degrees in mental health related work. And so sometimes people misunderstand the role of a school counselor depending on the level that they, they work in. Um, I think most of our elementary students and parents probably know that our school counselors on the elementary campuses are there to really support the social emotional needs of their students. But that also happens in middle school and high school. I think as our students get older, people tend to think that your counselors are truly there for your academic piece. And that is just a small component of what they do each day for our students. All of our campuses across the district have what we call a comprehensive counseling model that they follow. That is developed by the American School Counseling Association. And it really is based on helping our students enhance their academic, their career, their personal, and their social and emotional needs, um, and helping them to develop the skills that they need to be successful adults. It supports our students to engage as what we would say um, contributing members of our society. But more importantly, the work that our school counselors do is helping our students to build resiliency in all aspects of their lives. Since we're talking about mental health today, we want to make sure that our, our students have skills um, to be able to resolve any personal conflicts that they may have, but also be able to recognize in themselves when they're um, not feeling mentally well and how they need to connect themselves or connect one another to um, resources that will help them to be um, to move in a better direction. So our counselors are working with our students um, depending on the level and depending on the needs of the students. Our counselors will go into classrooms to do guidance lessons with our students on various different topics. They will also pull students out for groups um, and work with um, a small group of students, sometimes between six and 10 students on very specific skills. But our counselors will also work individually with students to help build some skills in certain areas. Within counseling services, um, we have the ability to um, have conversation with students and parents and decide, you know, the work that our school counselors is doing is amazing, but we also know that there may be a need for our school counselors to um, connect our families to additional resources. So um, we are very fortunate in Round Rock ISD to have our mental health centers. Our mental health centers are, are housed under Dr. Grosso's department, Behavioral Health. And we have a partnership with Blue Bonnet Trails who will come to our campuses and service our students with a, a live therapist to help them work through some of those um, therapeutic, mental health therapeutic needs they may have. We also have a program called T-Chat, which will provide um, a very similar mental health service, but that is 100% um, online for our students. And we think that these, these services are very valuable because um, our counselors, they're doing amazing work each day with our students. But as you'll see on this next slide, um, we have 150 um, counselors across our district for the nearly 50,000 students that we serve. And so by building these partnerships with places like Blue Bonnet Trails and T-Chat, we're able to get our students some services um, above and beyond what our counselors may be able to do while they're here with us on our campuses. And Dr. Rosa will talk a little bit more about some of the additional services that we've been able to bring into our district as we've been able to see how our students need um, additional access to mental health support. Dr. Grosso, you're on mute. Oh my gosh, thank you. I was, I was having a great time talking. <laughs> um, so behavioral health services is a newer department. I got hired in January of 2020. Um, and that was the first person in the department. And then we've slowly increased in size based on need and the needs that honestly our board of trustees saw and were able to say that funding for it needed to be a priority. So we hired our first group of social workers and they were fully in place by January of 2021. And so as you can see, there's two per learning community and they work hand in hand with campus staff, including the counselors that Dr. Lewis just talked about. Um, they 
only will see students when they rise to a higher level. So those referrals do come from campus counselors, and the administrators on campus, or even the school nurse. And they work hand in hand, not only with the campus, but also the families, truly believing that it is a, we have to help the entire family system. So they help from with things such as basic needs, but they also work with families on, with mental health supports, what supports in the community and really connecting them to what's needed. We also this year saw a need in two different area and one would, was crisis work. So we hired two crisis social workers in January. So they're helping lead a lot of the efforts within that and never realized um, they got to see immediately how they were there to support just with the recent tornado that happened. And both of them could be mobilized immediately and helping um, our families that were really displaced and providing services to them. And we didn't have to pull people from other campuses that they could continue their work. We These were just able to help um, at additional level. We also hired a staff social worker in um, January. And this came from that our social workers were getting referrals to support staff, which they were happy to do. But you know, sometimes that's hard if you're a staff member and you've already worked with a social worker supporting a student, but then sort of having to say, I'm struggling or I need help in a way. We didn't want that to be a barrier. And so we have um, a, a staff social worker that their whole role is supporting our staff. And that's any of the staff across the district. You know, they. Um, have met already with teachers or custodians or our maintenance workers. So really believing of how we partner with them and they work hand in hand with HR um, to support the staff that we have and knowing that that is a critical aspect that our staff's well-being impacts our student well-being. And so really having to look at our district holistically in that way. And then the last things that Dr. Lewis mentioned is Blue Bonnet Trails and T-Chat knowing, you know, they're, we have um, the support of these 13 social workers, but sometimes there's a different type of need that's needed. And so we do, we help manage these two programs, but it's definitely a collaboration with counseling services. And both of these um, are, people are referred either through counselor or social worker to teach at our Blue Bonnet Trails, the mental health centers, um, and knowing that these only happen with parent support. So your student would not be part of T-Chat or Blue Bonnet Trails without a parent support and parent saying, yes, I want that service to my student, because realizing it really is that family decision of what's needed. Also things that cut across all of our departments, but two that I wanted to mention that we do believe in this world of suicide prevention, that staff education is critical. Um, you know, just like all of us, we didn't just automatically know about mental health and suicide and the same as our staff. That's not a class that get taught when you learn, become a teacher. And so what is that information that we as counseling services and behavioral health services, since that's our area of expertise, how can we provide that information to staff? And so this year, our two departments partnered together to bring Talk Saves Lives which is from the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention. It's a research-based best practices, just an introduction to suicide, um, really diving deeper into those risk factors, warning signs, and what to do. And so all the counselors were trained to be able to deliver that. And then they went back to their campuses and provided that training to all staff. And um, I'm happy to report the feedback we got. Staff was very appreciative for the comprehensive training. And they said not only just for their work with students, but also in their personal lives or for they for themselves. And so we were really happy to see that. We also offer, um, we have a few social workers and a few counselors are about to be trained in this and it's youth mental health first aid. Um, we actually started training people last year based on a grant PTA had received from national PTA. And youth mental health first aid, it's more, it's almost a full day training, but it really is a fantastic course on what is mental health for youth and what does it look like in youth? What if a student's struggling, what does that look like? And whenever we've done this presentation across the district, I started it about three years ago and Dr. Lewis is a trainer for it too, that we have gotten the best feedback about the training and staff very much appreciating, understanding at a deeper level what students might be going through and also what's their role in it. Really telling teachers like if a student's struggling in this aspect, of mental health, it's not yours to fix. <laughs> That's why we have different people within the district and then outside resources. In the same way, if a kid broke their leg in your class, you're not gonna fix it. The same goes for our teachers. And so really giving on that. Also, all the nurses have been trained in youth mental health first aid, knowing that a lot of our students who are struggling with mental health concerns, it often comes as a physical health 
You know, if a student's struggling with a lot of anxiety, guess what? They might have tummy aches every day and they don't know to say it's anxiety, but their tummy is telling them that. And so really connecting all different departments and working and collaborating together to make sure students get what they need. And so now that we've talked about what we as a district are doing, we also wanted to give some feedback and I'll pass it to Dr. Lewis that what you yourself can do at home too. Yes, I think, you know, especially for, for our kiddos who are, are still school age um, or you're getting ready to, to come into, you know, the Round Rock ISD system, um, I think it's important to, to let people understand that the work that we do is really collaborative. Um, the work that we do inside of our, our school day is only going to be beneficial if we have the support of our parents outside of the school day as well. And so um, families may be asking, well, I understand what you're doing for my for my child while they're at school, but what can I do for my, my child while they're at home? And I think even though I'm talking about this from a how to support your child perspective, but I think all of these things are things you could do to support whether it's your a, an adult family member or your neighbor um, or a coworker. One of the most important things we can do is truly be a role model, um, be a voice for mental health. Make sure that when you're talking about mental health, you're talking about it on that spectrum that Dr. Gross had mentioned earlier, that we all have some form of mental health that goes from mental um, wellness to potential mental illness. And so it is truly a spectrum, just like our physical health. But also, I think as adults, sometimes we, we shy away from letting our kids see us struggle. Um, because we're coming off of COVID, we heard a lot of parents say, you know, I am struggling with being locked down <laughs> in my home. I am struggling with um, all these restrictions from COVID, but their children were not able to see that. Um, and yes, I'm not saying, you know, if you're going through something extremely difficult, that's going to be harmful for your child to see that you need to share that. But I think it's really impactful and really powerful for your child if they see that you too have hard days and that you do struggle because when they see that and then they see you on the other end of that, then they're able to say, you know what? Mom was able to get through this or dad was able to get through this. And so I can get through whatever it is that I'm going to as well. So being a role model for your child and having those really open conversations with them about, you know, some of the things that you may find difficult, some of the struggles that you may have had, um, even as a child, um, explaining that to them and letting them see that you came out on the other end. Um, I think is going to be really key to, to um, helping them to see that they can do the same. Um, help your child to develop a strong relationship with you and other supportive adults. We know, especially if we're talking about, you know, our preteens and our teenagers, that they're probably not going to come to mom and dad, but helping them to build those connections with other people. Maybe it's an aunt or an uncle. Maybe it's a teacher on campus, but supporting those really healthy um, adult relationships that they have in their life so that they're going to someone that's going to connect them to a resource. Um, <clears throat> ideally, we want them coming to you as parents. Um, if it is really difficult for you to have a conversation with your child about mental health, use this this video as an example say you know what i just sat through um, this really amazing conversation about mental health and i want to share with you what i learned today they may not really be listening or they may not look like they're listening but they're getting something from you i would also tell my my parents and my students when i worked on a campus that you know sometimes it can be really hard to have a conversation especially if you're struggling with something yourself or your kid is struggling instead of sitting down and talking Every kid has, you know, one of these, you know, they have a cell phone, right? Um, maybe it starts as a text conversation um, or call them when you know they're not going to answer and leave a voicemail for them to listen to. Um, I would also tell parents and students, you know, start an interactive journal where you are able to maybe write a question to your child or your child is able to write a question to you or give or say something to you and then they send it to you. You sit with it and really process what you're going to say to them before you respond. Because um, sometimes, our, I think as adults, we expect to have the right answer at the moment that our kid gives us, you know, a situation, and we don't always have the right answer. So being being um, honest with them and saying, you know what, I may not know the answer right now, but we're going to work through this together. And then also giving yourself some time to process what they are saying so that you can come up with um, an, a response that is not almost visceral, because um, we don't want you to come across as upset or angry. Um, we want you to come across as really empathetic and caring to what their needs are, even if you don't agree with it. So 
find a way where you can develop a um, a deeper, a stronger relationship with your child around this topic, around you know some of the concerns that they may have. It's also important that we try to um, minimize any negative influences and behaviors that may be going on with our with our kids. And I know that you know probably every parent is like, I do that already. But being really attentive and trying to really listen to what is really going on in your child's life um, and helping them to understand, you know maybe it's not don't do this because as soon as we say don't do or don't hang out with that person they're going to go do that but helping them to understand the why behind it um, whether we're talking about a person um, we also have on here be attended to the online activities or we're talking about you know what they're looking at online or what they're engaging in give them the why so they understand your rationale behind it rather it just being you know the role that mom and dad gave me um, and we talked about this one earlier as well um, as families, and especially in Texas, um, we, we uh, many of us love our firearms, uh, but minimizing your student's access or your child's access to ways in which they can self-harm, um, whether that is a firearm or whether that is a knife or anything like that, um, minimize their access to it. Maybe it means removing it completely from your home. Maybe it means locking it up or putting some barriers in between the the child and the the tool of whatever it may be, um, but minimizing that access. So, because we know that the longer it takes for a person, whether we're talking about a child or an adult, for the thought of something to their ability to act on it, the longer we have, the more time we have in between that, the um, more we decrease their ability to do it or their their desire to do it. And you know, we have on here prescription medications. I think this one is often um, something that we tend to not think about. We think about removing our firearms. We may think about taking our knives and our scissors out of our homes. But prescription medications, they're probably in almost every household there is, whether it's for allergy meds or heart medicine. Maybe they're going off to grandma's house who has, you know, a plethora of medications in the closet, in the um, medicine cabinet make sure that you're talking to all the individuals that your child may be going to their home um, to visit and, and helping them to understand why it's important that we remove these um, access to these means as well um, and then also i think it's extremely important that we check in with our doctors um, the doctors are there to to support you and your child and a lot of times we may go to the doctor and the doctor will ask us a few questions and we answer them but in the back of our head we have a whole list of things that we want to tell them and we may not think that it matters or it applies to the situation, but write that stuff down and, and um, make it a point that when you go to the doctor that you're telling them what is truly going on and you're asking those questions because we don't know what help they can provide to, them, to us and we won't know unless we ask them. But I think the, the biggest thing I want you all to walk away with today is that we're doing what we can within our school system, but we want your support. We want to be collaborative in this work to help support all of our students across our district, all of our families across our district. And um, one way that we can do that is by having really open and honest conversations with um, all the people that we care about in our lives and having those open and honest conversations with ourselves. Another way that we can do this is really um, connecting with those opportunities within our community to be around other people who are willing to learn and grow from um, experiences and learn and grow in the field of mental wellness. We have coming up April 30th, our fifth annual campus walk. This year it will be held at Wash Middle School at 10, 10 a.m. This walk was started five years ago by our amazing students within Round Rock ISD and our students, our high school and our middle school advisory council students came to us and said, you know what, you guys do some amazing work across the district. Our parents are amazing, but you know what we don't do? We don't talk about mental health and we think it's an important conversation to have. And so our middle school and high school students that were serving on this advisory council started this walk five years ago to bring awareness to the mental health needs of, for people in our community across our district. And so we would like to have you join us this April 30th, again at 10 o'clock at Walsh Middle School for this walk. And we also wanna make sure that we provide you with some additional resources that you can use. And it's completely free. I just wanna add that. <laughs> so we would love to have everybody, people often say like, is it appropriate to bring younger kids? You know, I've um, I work, I've done this work since my child way before he was born and he's eight now and he's been going to these type of walks 
ever since then. And you know, what's developmentally appropriate. The theme of the walk always is hope walks here. And I think all of us at any age can benefit from that. Yeah, and I will say um, in one of those pictures, you see my feet, my my two little kids feet and my, my um, youngest is 10. He'll be 10 here in a few weeks. Um, and he started going to these walks at the very first one. So at the time he was five. And I think this goes back to those, to what we were saying earlier is having those conversations with your your children as soon as possible and maybe it's not you know the big conversation about suicide are you thinking about that but it's a conversation about how you take care of yourself mentally we we talk to them all the time if you're not feeling good if you if your head hurts or if your nose is running your tummy is upset come talk to us but we want to make sure that we're starting those conversations early with them about when they don't feel mentally or emotionally well yeah, I remember even when my son started, I explained we went to those because we didn't want people to feel, we didn't think anybody should ever feel like they're alone. And I think those are concepts that like elementary kids, all of us can get behind. And and also you can talk to your students about, um, did you do circle time today? What did you discuss? What are the best things from your day? What made you sad? Was there anything that was out of the ordinary and just making sure you're just asking questions and, and giving them that opportunity to, to say what, what makes them sad or what makes them happy. And that just builds on, on the relationship with everyone and being able to relate back that you are wondering what's happening at school. What are those good things? What are the things that are not as positive and how can we work through those and problem solve and move toward the future? Um, and I think that's Im important for everyone and for the teachers in their lives, for any adults that, like we said, building that support system and those important people that are around our students, you know, and our kids at all times. I always ask, I often ask parents, do you ask about emotions and feelings as much as you ask about academics? And where we put our time and energy as parents, that's what students will think is important. And, and you know, th that's not how most of us were raised. So I don't want parents ever to feel bad about this. I also, parents, I want you to hear me specifically that if your child's struggling with their mental health, it doesn't mean you're a bad parent. It does not mean you're a bad parent. It means you have an opportunity to get your child the help they need. And there is nothing better about parenting than getting the, your child the help they need. And it doesn't mean you're a failure in any way. In the same way, when physical things happen to our kids, it doesn't mean we failed. It just means we know where to take them and that we don't try to fix it ourselves, right? We take them to a professional and the same as with mental health. And that's where we want to make sure you have resources. And these are just a few of the resources that we have in the district. Um, we have websites there, but there's some out of district um, organizations that are helpful. NAMI is a fantastic one. There's chapters all over the United States and they provide um some great parent education groups or parent support groups if your child's struggling, and that can be really helpful. So you can look at that organization, AFSP.org, um, which we've mentioned previously. Um, it has some great resources. If you yourself have lost a loved one to suicide, they have a whole list of support groups that can be really helpful. They also have great information if you have a loved one who's had an attempt. And so really being able to say, seek out that information and then both behavioral health and Counseling services, which includes SEL, they have amazing resources on there. And we want all of y'all to know, too, that if you're, you have questions or you're struggling, like reach out, reach out to your counselor, reach out to us. That's why we're here. I loved how Dr. Lewis said it truly is a collaborative effort. Um, I, and mental health is a community effort right? It's not just the school. It's not just the parents. It's all of us as a community really coming together and saying that this is an important topic. Do you have anything else to add, ladies? No, just thank you for participating and listening to our talk and, and presenting such great information from both of you. 
Yes, I, I just want to say thank you and for all the parents and community members that may be watching this. Thank you so much for taking the time because this is a really important conversation. Um, and, and like Dr. Grosso said, we're, we're all here to support you and, and don't hesitate to reach out to us if you need more re resources or information. And I just want to commend anybody watching this that you watching this is suicide prevention work, right? It, we often think it's these grand things. It's the things we do every day. It's the little things. We never know how a little thing is going to impact somebody's life forever. And you yourself getting information and education and understanding at a deeper level and being willing even to do that and have that conversation, you are helping in this effort for suicide prevention and mental health awareness. So we thank you and we hope to see you in more, a lot, both all of our departments do training opportunities and working. And so we hope to see you in more of those as we continue to provide great education, not only to our staff and students, but also families in the community.